thanks for staying or coming, everyone. Um, we'll just continue pretty much right where Natalie left off. Uh, I do want to spend two minutes explaining uh, this vulnerability. Um, it's again like a cycle issue uh, during uh, NS unarchiving, again in the shared key dictionary. Um, so basically what you have to know is there's a shared key dictionary um, that at the top right, you can see it, it's basically an array of values and a pointer to a shared key set. And a shared key set itself uh, is a linked list, so they can have sub, sub, uh, sub key sets. Um, and then they have the number of keys they store, then a rank table, and then the, the array of keys, right? And so the way the lookup works is you take the, you, you want to look up K1 maybe, or K, let's go with K3. Um, so you want to look up K3, you go to the first shared key set, you hash the value K3 basically, um, and use that as index into the rank table. And then the rank table gives you an index into the keys array, right? Uh, but that index is bounce checked against num key, okay? And so in this case, it wouldn't find the key K3 in the first key set, it would go to the second key set, uh, do the same thing, find K, uh, the key K3, and then that, that's the index for the values array in the shared key dictionary. Um, why is this important? Well, really the only important thing here is uh, this one invariant um, that num key must be equal to the length of this array. If that's not the case, then there's a big problem because then this rank table stuff can index out of bounds. Um, let's see how this init with coda looks like for, for this kind of object. It's fairly straightforward. Really what it does is like take all the values out of the archive, right? This is like this decode. So it decodes the num key uh, field and the rank table field. Um, then it decodes the sub key set. And then the first if statement, uh, that's where it makes sure this invariant holds, right? That like key length of the keys array must be equal. Um, and then interestingly, there's a for loop where it tries to look up every key just to make sure that it's like useful, that it can actually look up all the keys. Um, lo looks pretty much okay, uh, but let's see what happens when we try to mess with it. Um, so we start with an empty shared key set at the top. We start decoding these values. Okay, num key, let's put in some, some uh, interesting values, FFFF and 414141. And then we go uh, and decode a second one here. Uh, and we do the whole thing again, right? We start from the top. We fill in all these values. Um, and now we actually make a cycle, and this is like not, not how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> um, and you make a cycle back to shared key set one, and this actually works. There's handling, there's logic in the keyed unarchiver to make this possible. Um, okay, and then we decode the keys. And this is okay, right? Like num key and the, rank, uh, the keys length is the same. Um, and now we try to look up every key. Um, and so in this case, we are here we, we decode, uh, we, we look up the key in shared key set two, and it isn't being found because the index is 42. It's not, that's not the right one. So we recursed uh, to shared key set one, and now all of a sudden, um, here we have a memory corruption because now this invariant doesn't hold, right? It's num key is hex FFFFF. Um, so it thinks this keys area is gigantic, but really it's null pointer, and so we can access an arbitrary address. Um, and have that be used as an Objective-C object. So that's the bug. It gives us an arbitrary address dereference, and that's what we're going to exploit now. Um, right, so this is just a summary. Again, our bug primitive. Uh, so how do you exploit this kind of bug? Um, basically, what you need to do is to create some kind of fake object um, and have that object be used, right? So this, this pointer that's being read this absolute pointer is that's being treated as a pointer to an Objective-C object, and it will call methods on it, so that should be exploitable if we can fake these. Um, in particular, I think it will call like dialog or is ns string on this thing, and so what you would have to do is like fake an Objective-C object, um, have a class pointer that points to a fake Objective-C class, and then that Objective-C class has the function pointers, and those will be called, so once you have control over that, you can get code execution. Now, the obvious problem we have here is uh, ASLR. Uh, so we don't actually know where anything is in memory. We don't know where our fake objects end up when we put them in memory. And uh, we also don't know where libraries are, so we don't have code pointers. Um, and we'll tackle this problem in two parts. Part one is we'll do heap spraying, 
which is an old technique, uh, but it still works. Um, and so what you do basically is you allocate uh, maybe 256 megabytes of memory. This is fairly easy over iMessage actually due to the un uh, unarchiver. Um, and once we have allocated that much memory, then at this one address, the hex 1170s, there will be controlled data, our data. Um, and so this is how we can put fake objects into memory, which is spray 256 megabytes, and then our fake objects are uh, located at a known address. And this is pretty good. Um, the second part is more complicated. So the problem we now still have is we don't know any code pointers. Um, and so because we can't like, uh, inject executable code into the process, we have to know the addresses of existing executable code. So we need library addresses. Um, and this problem, I had two different approaches for that, for, for uh, tackling that problem. Um, and I, I, I kind of followed both, but then I, I didn't really get the first one to work, but the second one worked. But I still want to go through both of them because I think they are kind of interesting. Uh, the idea for the first one is basically to work around ASLR um, and, and like deal with not knowing these addresses. So one typical example here is uh, partial pointer overrides. Right. If you like have a one byte overwrite into a pointer, then you can do some interesting stuff without actually knowing where the pointer points to. Um, this doesn't work here because of the bug. The bug is like an absolute address DRAF. Um, but maybe we can do something similar. Uh, well, and the second idea is to properly, I guess, break ASLR uh, and, and get addresses uh, to then yeah, fake objects and so on. Um, start with the first one. So the rough idea I had was to to do a heap spray um, without knowing library addresses, but instead um, having the, the application itself put in some pointers into the spray, into the contents of the heap spray. So maybe it makes it more clear with this image. Um, so my heap spray is at this hex 1170 address, and what I want to put there are uh, fake objects that have some valid pointers in them that the application itself puts in there. And then I have a pointer maybe to some interesting global object. Um, and since that's part of a faked object, maybe I can make the, the process do something interesting to it. Um, like that's the really vague idea that I had. Um, one example how this can work in our scenario here uh, is the, the NSKeyed unarchiver. It allows uh, decoding C style arrays, like, well, just fixed size arrays. You tell it, like, give me 10 an array of 10 or decode me 10 integers or so. Um, and actually, it also supports decoding class pointers uh, for I don't know why. It just seems like a really absurd feature. Um, but what, you, what this lets you do is it lets you create uh, a linear array in memory with pointers to classes. And then if you look at Objective-C objects, um, and in memory, an Objective-C object is just a pointer to a class and then the fields that it has, right? Uh, and so with that, we can suddenly create um, somewhat valid-looking Objective-C objects without knowing addresses. So to make this more clear, um, the picture at the bottom, um, the archive we put in pretty much just has the string NS array in it, where it's like, this is an array of classes, and each entry is the class NS array. So I just need the name of the class. And then the keyed unarchiver will go ahead and like look up the name of this class, look up the class object, and put in the pointer to that class into this memory buffer. And so I end up with this memory dump on the right side. Um, and now this suddenly looks like a legitimate NS array because the first quad word is a pointer to a class, the NS array class. Um, and so now I've been able to fake objects without actually knowing any addresses. Um, I pursued this a bit further. I, I guess the f furthest I got was I, I, uh, I was able to basically free some object and then make the application um, lower or decrement some ref count. Um, now that, that ref count would also be uh, a pointer to a class, or would, like the, the thing that would be where the ref count would be decremented was also pointed to a class. Um, and so it just so happened that if you look at a class object, the first quad word is again a pointer to a class, a meta class, and the second quad word is the pointer to the super class, right? So Objective C has inheritance, um, and these class objects, the, the second quad word is always the pointer to the super class. And now, due to this reference count decrement, 
uh, it was I was able to decrement the second pointer to the superclass, um, which is kind of hilarious because it lets lets you change the, the inheritance hierarchy at runtime because this is writable, uh, but it's not immediately useful. At least I couldn't really see uh, something immediately yeah, to do with this. Um, so I kind of gave up on that idea, um, but I still think it's, it could be done. Um, there's probably more you can do, like more primitives you can gain by, by faking objects in a similar way or doing other clever things. So that's why I wanted to include it here. Um, the other option that ended up working is, well, properly defeating ASLR, which, uh, which has two steps or two parts to it. Uh, the one, the first part is we need some kind of communication channel to leak data back. Um, and the second part is we have to exploit the bug in, in such a way that we get some info over this uh, communication channel. Uh, so let's deal with the channel first. Um, here's a screenshot of iMessage. Um, and here you can nicely see the three different states the message can be in. So the first one is read, the second is delivered, and the third is none of those. Um, and the way this works is through deliver, or I guess receipts, iMessage receipts. Um, and so there's read receipts, which say, yes, I, uh, I got this message and the user actually read it. Um, and the second type is delivery receipts. And those are sent automatically, which makes it very interesting, um, by this IM agent process that Natalie mentioned. Um, and, uh, and so we get them automatically once the message arrives in IM agent. And so this is going to be our communication channel because now we get some kind of information back uh, from the process. So let's build something cool with that, uh, an oracle. Um, on the left, there is some rough pseudocode um, about how this, this um, message processing and IAM agent works and the delivery receipt sending. Um, and so the key point here is that the NS unarchiving happens before the delivery receipt is being sent. And what this gives us now um, is basically a crash oracle, because if we can trigger a crash during the unarchiving, then we won't see a delivery receipt. And if we don't crash, then we see a delivery receipt. So all of a sudden, we have a one, basically one bit uh, information leak. Did it crash? Did it not crash? And now the remaining challenge is to crash when some condition is met so that we infer some kind of, uh, some piece of information from that. Okay, so that's the communication channel. Uh, let's go to exploitation. Um, before we do that, um, the, some, some iOS internals, uh, there's this thing called DYLD shared cache. The idea is you take all the, or the majority of system libraries and you pre-link them into one gigantic binary blob. Uh, which is around one gigabyte in size, so it's pretty gigantic, and that is shared uh, and mapped in all user space processes on iOS. Um, and there's three things about this that are very interesting. The first is it's always mapped in this address region of four gigabyte between 1.8 and 2.8, uh, seven zeros. Um, the second is the randomization granularity is 4,000 hex 4,000 bytes um, because of large pages in iOS. Um, but the third is the most interesting one. Um, the shared cache is actually mapped at the same address in every process uh, on, this, on the same device. So it's only randomized per boot is, is what this means. Um, which means that, for example, if we crash IAM agent, we know that when it respawns the next time, the shared cache is still at the same address. Okay, so let's build an oracle. Um, the, the bug that I showed uh, that gives us the arbitrary address deref primitive um, can, is, is basically gives us this oracle function. So we put in some address, and it will only not crash if the address is mapped, and then if the value that's at that address is either zero or if it like, looks like a valid Objective-C pointer, which means it can have the most significant bit set, then it, it looks like a tagged pointer, or it actually points to a valid Objective-C thing. Um, so only if these conditions are met will it not crash when we give it an address. Otherwise, it will crash. Um, and now we can observe this crash because we either get a delivery receipt or we don't. So that's the idea. Um, so what do we do with this? Part zero, uh, offline, so that this doesn't need network connection. Um, we will 
basically compile a profile of a shared cache um, given this Oracle function. So this is really simple. You, you take the DYLD shared cache, you get it from IPSW, um, whatever. Um, so you have this huge binary, you take the Oracle function and you just run it over the entire shared cache and the result is basically like a bitmap, right? Bit one, bit zero, bit one, uh, depending on whether this function returns true or false. Um, and so here on, at the bottom you can see an example profile and maybe the white area means this is where it wouldn't crash and the black area means this is where it would crash uh, when probing. Uh, in practice there's a third state um, because, for example, there's a writable area in the shared cache and you don't know if that at runtime what, what will be there. Um, but it makes it easier to explain with a two-state <coughs> sorry, uh, with a two-state profile. Um, so the next step is then to do some linear uh, memory scan. Um, we know the, the possible region where the shared cache is mapped. You can see it on the right in this image. Um, and so we just go in like, for example, 256 megabyte increments and just go over this range, um, query this oracle, and at some point it will return true or like we will get a delivery receipt and then we know, okay, we have found some address uh, somewhere in the shared cache, like maybe this 19007400. The next thing we do is, again, offline, um, we have to now compute all the possible base addresses <coughs> Sorry, um, that would lead to us not crashing on this p particular address that we just probed. Uh, and this is, again, very easy. Um, we just go in page size steps over our shared cache profile. Um, and now every, well, every, in this picture, every white region uh, is now a potential candidate. Right, because this this is the 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 eight bytes that we could have just probed uh, in this case, um, and so in practice, I think this will leave us with maybe thirty to forty thousand candidates because the shared cache is gigantic. It's like, uh, well, like one gigabyte or so in size. Okay, so we have all these candidates. Last step, uh, we need to eliminate them until we have just one remaining, and I think this is either best to explain with an image. So suppose I just have five, five candidates uh, left here, um, and that they are now all mapped at different addresses. That's why they're like shifted, right? Um, and you can see the initial address that we probed, um, it like goes only through white, white space um, because it didn't crash, right? Uh, so that's the initial address. And now we pick another address to probe um, so that roughly half of the candidates will have a one bit and the other half has a zero bit. Um, and so this way, regardless of what this, this uh, uh, oracle returns, we are able to roughly discard half the remaining candidates, right? So in this case, uh, if it crashes, then we know we either have the first or the last uh, profile, right? Because there's th this is where the black area is. And if it doesn't crash, we have one of the three middle ones. Um, and so we just keep doing this, and in, in every step we basically uh, halve the number of remaining candidates. And so this is really fast in practice. This takes like 20 or so queries to go from 30,000 candidates to just one. Okay, so, and this will then, then tell us the base address of the shared cache. Right, so uh, I think I have just about enough time. Um, so this, now this is what it looks like. We have all the addresses. And this is good enough for any device that doesn't support pointer authentication, mm. which is every device before the iPhone uh, XS. Um, on the XS and newer, I, uh, Apple has a new feature called pointer authentication. Um, the like, half-minute idea is that you take everything that's a function pointer, or it can be any pointer in theory, um, and you sign it at, at process startup, for example. And so you do this with a specific instruction, as you can see in the bottom. And then you have a signature and you store that in the top bits. Um, and then before using a pointer, for example, for jumping to it, you authenticate and make sure the signature is actually valid. Um, and if it's not, then you crash. Um, and so this prevents us from doing, like, directly gaining uh, control over the PC program counter. Um, because we, we are not able to fake these, 
these signatures. So we need to bypass PEC. Um, so this is pretty much what I said, right? The, we cannot fake these code pointers anymore. Um, the idea for the bypass roughly is that um, while we cannot use, while we cannot fake classes, we can reuse existing classes. Um, and so here in this case, I have a fake Objective C object, but it points to a real existing class with signed function pointers. Um, and this will ultimately give me some form of arbitrary Objective C method call primitive, uh, where we can call any method or almost any method with pretty much controlled arguments. Um, and this is powerful enough. This is uh, all, all that's necessary. Okay. So we can now uh, execute arbitrary Objective-C methods also outside of the sandbox because this was on iOS 12.4 where the, the unarchiving still happened outside of a sandbox, uh, can access user data, etc. We don't care about that, we just want a calculator. Uh, the way to do it is you call this one, or one way to do it is you call this one Objective-C method um, to launch an application named the calculator. And uh, let's see can get that to work. Okay. So, do, do, do. Yeah, okay. So this is the iPhone I'm using. Um, it's still on 12.4, right? So this is the last vulnerable version, like at this point more than half a year old. Um, and let's start this. I hope it works. Okay, so what, what you can see now, um, <laughs> okay, it's recording. It's kind of unnecessary. Anyway, uh, what you can see now is it's going to do this linear uh, scanning phase, <laughs> right? And it's nicely telling us what it's doing at um, this point. And so it's probing these, these addresses. And I think this step is either 128 or 256 megabytes uh, increments. And so it's testing these addresses. Um, and it's not getting a delivery received back. So it assumes, OK, it crashed. And now this for this one address, the hex 1b, um, it did get uh, a receipt back, and now it knows, okay, it has found a, a valid address. Um, and it has, it did this, this candidate computation thing uh, and figured it had uh, 32,000 candidates. Um, and now it's going to roughly half that number in every, with every additional, additional message. Um, so you can see it already went down to 15 or 16,000 roughly, um, and it will keep doing that. Uh, and I think I can actually take questions now while this <laughs> runs. This will take like another one or two minutes. Uh, so maybe it's a good time to take questions if there are any at this point. Are there? No. No, no. Come on, make me run through the room. Oh, there's one. Hi there. Uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. I guess that only works because iMessage is like restarting in the background all the time because it's crashing. Exactly, right. So this is really important. Um, so the IM agent is just restarted every time it crashes. Uh, there is one, one, one thing happen that happens is if it crashes uh, too quickly, there will be a respawn delay. Like there will be a penalty and it won't be restarted for a couple of minutes. Um, and so I always have to wait about 10 seconds between two consecutive crashes. Um, and this is why I can only, well, probe the Oracle every t once every 10 seconds, roughly. Uh, but it's still, like, it's really uh, not, a, not a big issue. Uh, and this is probably something that should be fixed if it's not already fixed, uh, that this daemon just restarts all the time. Yeah. Okay, uh, almost through. I think. Yeah, I'm al also almost out of time. Let's see if this finishes in 30 seconds. Uh, I don't think it will. Um, 
But yeah, so it has found the, the base address now. Uh, it's 19A2B four zeros. Um, and now it's doing a heap spray. And this is also really, um, really hacky right now. I think, so I am like doing this in, as you can say, uh, till in 24 steps. Um, I'm very certain with some better engineering, you could do the whole heap spray in one single message and like do one single message that does heap spray plus trigger the bug, but I'm doing this in like 25 or so. Um, yeah. Sorry, Stefan. <laughs> I, I hope it's going to work. It better. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see. So when it triggers, actually the phone freezes, the UI freezes for a couple of seconds. I don't know why, but I think that's what happened now because the second on the clock, the seconds don't move further. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, just a just quick question, that please. Yes. Um, is there a, ch a chance that it fails? And if so, do you know why? It, is, it, is it possible that it fails? Um, so it's possible that it fails, um, but not nothing that can be f that can't be fixed. So one reason is uh, if the <coughs> um, this ASLR bypass, if it finds a like writable page and finds something where an ex actual pointer is, then right now this implementation handles this incorrectly, and also the heap spray is. It would be much much better if it happened in one message, because now if like some allocation happens between two of these then it could fail, yeah. 